to go to chat. Well, y'all are quiet, so I guess it's time to start. <laughs> That's usually a good signal. Everybody's ready. Let's go. Let's go. Get you on the road. Well, we're glad y'all are here tonight. Hope everybody uh, enjoyed the afternoon. I even sat outside a little while myself. It's just such a beautiful day out. So uh, hopefully y'all enjoyed the day or got a nap or whatever it was you needed to do this afternoon. And we're glad that you're here tonight. So I wanted to mention our sick list again, uh, Jim Gann and Orthella Torbett, as we said, are doing about the same, uh, Evelyn and Darlene Peel, uh, Julie still has the flu, uh, Keisha's dad, uh, and her uncle Harper uh, has cancer, we announced that this morning, and so she told me now also her sister Carmen has COVID right now, so they're, they're kind of going through a lot of stuff, so let's uh, remember them. Uh, Eva Sue and Fanny still continuing to recover. Crystal has, of course, has cancer. Uh, Chester, we updated him today. So he's doing about the same. Uh, we want to add uh, Harley Bowers. This is Jesse's brother-in-law. And so he has apparently had cancer in the past, but now it's come back. Is that correct? Am I saying that right? Okay. So uh, Harley Bowers. So we need to pray for him that, that they can treat that and do something uh, about that. Uh, Big Springs members having a gospel meeting that started today. Uh, so tomorrow night, Tuesday night, that'll be 7 o'clock with Bill Haywood doing the preaching. So if you get a chance to go over there, that would be good. Uh, that's all I have. So uh, Brother Steve Neal, after the second song, will lead us in our opening prayer. And then Brother Lane at the conclusion of the services, he'll lead us in our closing prayer. So we'll turn the singing over to Brother Cheryl. Evening, everyone. Evening. Let's get your song book and turn to number 249. 249.
to do in the way that you want us to do. Dear Father, several names have been named that name that are sick, that have any problem. We ask you to put your loving hand around them and around their families so they can be supported and strong. And of course, we want them brought back to health. And if that not be thy will, we ask you to help us to be strong and accept what you have in store. Father, we're so thankful for all the medical know-how that you've given us, the doctors and the nurses and the technicians and the medicines and all, that you've given us that we can extend our lives and make our lives <coughs> more comfortable. We just thank you so much for that. Father, there's also people that are having problems, uh, financial problems, work problems, family problems, all sorts of, of problems, and we ask you to help them too. That can be just as medical as an illness, and we ask you to please help them. Father, we ask you to be with Mark tonight as he brings his, his lesson, and we ask you to open our hearts and our ears, and, and we'll put the outside world away, and we'll contemplate on what Mark has to say to us tonight. <coughs> Father, we ask you to forgive us from our many sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs> Ladies, turn your song book to number 316. Number 316. We'll thank this before the lesson. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, swinging on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace of mind, swinging on the everlasting arms. Swinging, swinging, safe and secure from Once again, we'd like to welcome you all for being here. If you would, be turning to the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation. Appreciate Cheryl for that good song leading. Gets our minds in the right place to worship God tonight. And so if you'll remember, last week, we began what, as I said, Lord willing, will be a, a seven-part series we are looking at the seven churches of Asia. And in the book of Revelation, you will find letters to these seven congregations of the Lord's church. And so we are taking these in the order that John records them in the book of Revelation. Last week, we talked about the church at Ephesus and the lessons we could learn there. And so tonight, we're looking at this second letter that is written to the congregation of the brethren that met at the city of Smyrna. 
And so we want to see what we can learn here. Well, let, let me give you a little bit of background about the city of Smyrna. Okay, it was located roughly about 35 miles from Ephesus, about north of Ephesus. So roughly probably the distance from, from here to Cleveland. You're talking about kind of about that area, which would have been a lot further away for them because they didn't have an interstate. Uh, so that would have been a pretty good travel distance between the two cities. But that gives you kind of geographically where it was at. It was a, a port city on the Aegean Sea, and so it had become a rather important uh, center of trade for the Roman Empire. So it was a, a wealthy city overall. They made a lot of money as a city of uh, commerce. Most biblical scholars and secular scholars as well trying to do the research, uh, they believe that around the time that this letter was written, toward the end of the first century, the population of Smyrna would have been roughly in the neighborhood of about 100,000 people. So especially for that time period, it, it's a rather large, you didn't have a whole lot of cities that were that size. The Agora, there are still some ruins left from the ancient city of Smyrna. The Agora, or the marketplace, uh, we do know there was a big altar there to Zeus. And this was a city that had a lot of temples to various gods. And also it was a city that was dedicated to the concept of emperor worship. That the, the Roman emperors declared themselves to be gods and they expected to be worshipped. And that was very much uh, taking place in the city of Smyrna. So that gives you some idea what the, the Christians who lived there, kind of the, the environment they lived in and and what they were dealing with. So let's look there. If you look at Revelation chapter 2, we're going to look at this letter in verses 8 through 11 in Revelation chapter 2. So if you'll read that along with me as we go. Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. And unto the angel of the church at, in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. So this is the letter to the church at Smyrna. So tonight we want to look at this letter. What is the message? What are the things that are being said in this letter? First of all, we want to talk about the author. Who is this that is speaking? Well, once again, just like last week, this is Jesus speaking. Now, John is writing it down under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but Jesus is the one talking to the brethren at Smyrna. He has a message for them, just like he did, we noticed last week at, at Ephesus. So notice there in verse 8, that first verse, he says, these things saith the first and the last. So Jesus refers to himself as the first and the last. And that is because he is God. You have the Father, you have the Son, you have the Holy Spirit. Three entities that are really one. They all make up the Godhead. And they are known as the Alpha and the Omega. So if you hold your place there, turn over to Revelation 22 and verse 13. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are known as the Alpha and Omega. That's the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. And it means that God is eternal. God has always been. The Father has always been. Jesus has always been. The Holy Spirit has always been. Okay, so look at Revelation 22, verse 13, where God says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So Jesus identifies, coming back to Revelation 2, he identifies himself here. This way, the brethren at Smyrna, they know from whom this letter is coming, and it comes with the full authority 
of God. It's not some man's opinion. It's not even John's opinion. They know he has transcribed this coming from Jesus. Now, we see also in the end of verse 8, after he says, I'm the first and the last, it says, which was dead and is alive. Now, that is a clear reference, obviously, to the crucifixion and the resurrection. So Jesus saying, I was dead, I was nailed to the cross and was dead for three days, but I rose again. So that's what he's referencing again, showing that this message is coming from our Savior and it has the full authority of him. Now, going to verse 9, we want to notice the omniscient characteristics of Jesus where he begins this verse, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. So he tells them, I know. Jesus as God, so he knows everything that is going on in the church at Smyrna. Just like today, he knows everything that we're doing. What we say, what we think, Jesus knows all. And he did then too. So he said, him, I know the things that are going on in your congregation. I know what you are going through. So he's telling them that. So he knows all about, and he mentions these three things. So we want to look tonight at these three things, just briefly look at each one and see what we can tell about it. So first of all, Jesus said that he knows their works. So I know thy works. So if you'll be, hold your place there, turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. What we notice here in this letter is there is a high degree of faithfulness that is indicated here because apparently the brethren at Smyrna, they have done, they have engaged in a multitude of good works. And Jesus is saying, I know all the good things that you have done. Because the important thing here we notice, as opposed to last week, we looked at Ephesus, you see here Jesus offers no criticism. So Ephesus, he said, yeah, you guys have done these good things. However, here's some stuff you haven't done well. Well, we don't see that in the letter to the church of Smyrna. So apparently the brethren there, they had done a really good job with their good works. And Jesus is pleased with what they have done. So look at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So it's apparent that the brethren at Smyrna, they had fulfilled this commandment. Otherwise, Jesus would have called them out. I said, well, you've done some things, but you're not doing everything you should do. But there's no criticism at all. So they have fulfilled uh, this commandment to do these things. So that's what Jesus knows about their works. And so he's commending them for the things that they've done. Well, then he says, I know about your tribulations, the trials, the things that you're going through. Now, undoubtedly, this included both physical and spiritual suffering. They were going through both. And we're going to explore that a little bit more later. But we want to notice that this is the natural part of life for every Christian, not just the brethren at Smyrna, but it applies to us today as well. So if you look there at Philippians chapter 1 and verse 29, we notice this idea that suffering is, that's part of the life of a Christian. When Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, that's what he's talking about. So we have a certain amount of suffering that we're going to have to go through. So Philippians 1 29 says, for unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. And we talked about this morning that, you know, if we're living for Christ, we're going to make enemies. If we're teaching people the truth, we're going to make enemies. People are going to hate us. People are going to persecute us. And the Bible tells us here in Philippians that's going to happen. You're, you're going to suffer for Christ's sake if you're doing what you're supposed to do. Now, if we can go through our life... And if we see a, a lack of opposition to how we're living, we see a lack of resistance to how we're living, then that tells us, or it ought to tell us, that we're doing something wrong. If, if nobody's opposed or nobody's upset with the way we're living, we're doing something wrong. Okay, look at 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. 
we know this because this is what God tells us in his word that if nobody's coming after us, then we're not doing what we ought to be doing. 2 Timothy 3, 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So he says here, everyone, every single person that is living righteously, they are doing the commands of God, they are teaching others, living a Christian life, says if you're doing that, you will be persecuted for it. Not by everybody, of course, but some people are going to take offense because you're living righteously and, and they don't like that. Okay, so it says we're going to suffer persecution. Now, the brethren at Smyrna, they were being persecuted because they were living righteously. Again, Christ offers no criticism. He's commending them. You guys are doing what you're supposed to do. And because of that, they were being persecuted. We'll talk about that more in a couple minutes here. Now, we want to notice, if you'll turn over to Matthew chapter 5, we want to notice that as Christians, of course, we don't want to seek out opposition. But it is going to come our way, and we must endure it. We have to stay faithful. Okay, look at Matthew 5, beginning in verse 11. And this may sound odd, but again, if, we're, if we understand the scriptures, this makes sense. Jesus said, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. So Jesus calls that a blessing. And most people would go, well, well I, don't, I don't want people reviling me and hating me. How is that possibly a blessing? Well, keep reading. Verse 12 says, rejoice and be exceeding glad. Again, why should I be glad? Because people are picking on me and persecuting me. Here it is. For great is your reward in heaven. That's what we are to rejoice about. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So I know if I'm being persecuted because of my faith, because of the way I'm living my life, then that's a pretty good indication that what I'm doing is pleasing to God. It may be just pleasing to a lot of men, but it's pleasing to God. And Jesus says here, I have a reward waiting for me in heaven. So I can suffer a little bit of persecution on earth for a few years. I can take a little bit of suffering for a few years for an eternity of peace and bliss. I can take it. I may not like it all the time, but he's telling us we, we really ought to like it because it's showing us that we're living right. We're doing what he wants us to do. And notice we're in really good company. He says, hey, all the people that followed God before, all the prophets, as far as you want to go back, every one of those guys was persecuted. So if I'm being persecuted like Moses was and all these other, then I'm in pretty good company. So I'm okay with that. So that's what he's telling us that we should do. So he's telling them, look, I know your tribulations. I know you're being persecuted and you're suffering, but you guys are doing a great job. You hang in there. I'm very pleased with what you're doing because you're trying your best to serve me. And so he's commending them for that. Well, then after this, he mentions one more thing. He talks about, he says, I know their poverty. I know your poverty. Now, we said a minute ago that Smyrna was a very wealthy city because of all the Roman trade that, that went on there. So for Jesus to say this, it must be that the brethren, the Christians there at the congregation of Smyrna, they were not enjoying the prosperity that a lot of other people had in the city. So they were poor in a worldly sense. They didn't have a lot of money. They didn't have a lot of goods and possessions like probably a lot of the people did in the city. And so Jesus is acknowledging that. And we want to note here that they must have been really, really bad off. Because as we'll go through these other letters, Lord willing, we're going to notice this is the only, out of the seven letters, this is the only one where Jesus mentions their abject poverty. He doesn't say that about any of the other six churches. And so it must have been severe. For Jesus to say, hey, I know how poor you are. Okay? But he's talking about, again, in those, those worldly goods. Now, if you'll hold your place there, go over to Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. We want to notice that that really doesn't matter. Okay? You, you don't have a lot of worldly goods. You don't have a lot of money in your bank account. 
You don't have a fancy home to live in, but none of that matters anyway. So look at Luke 12 and verse 15. And he, Jesus, said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Now, we talked about that this morning as well in our Bible study, and the idea here is not Jesus is not saying it is sinful to be wealthy. He's not saying that you cannot accumulate some possessions. Of course you can, but what he's saying is you don't need to put that first in your life. If that's what you're all about, then you're missing the point. So he said in your life, what really matters is your soul, and that has nothing to do with your bank balance, nothing at all. And that's what he's saying here. And so he's telling these, look, you're really poor, materially speaking, but that's not going to matter anyway. That doesn't make any bit of difference when it comes to your salvation. That's what he's telling us. But notice, going back to Revelation 2 again, in that verse 9, when he says, I know thy works, tribulation, and poverty. Notice what he says right after poverty. But thou art rich. What? Uh, Jesus, I, you just said they were poor. Usually that's a contrary, you're poor, but you're rich. What, what the, so most of the time we go, what does it make any sense? What in the world is he talking about? So Jesus, in spite of your poverty, you're very rich. You're very well off. Well, because he's not talking about money. That's not what he's got in mind here. So how can both of these things be true? They're poverty stricken, and yet they're rich. Well, notice for one thing, they are rich in the faith, which is more important than money. Turn over to James chapter 2 and verse 5. They were rich in the faith because they were obeying the gospel. They were doing what they were supposed to do in spite of their material uh, condition. James chapter 2 verse 5 says, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith? faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him that's what it means to be rich in the faith right I don't care about being rich in a worldly sense if I'm an heir to the kingdom if I am on track to go to heaven that is a treasure that nobody could compensate me for you can't pay me enough money to forego my trip to heaven I, I, it, there's, it, that's priceless so I'm not going to trade that for a million dollars or a billion dollars. or So that's what he's saying. It's like, you're, you're heirs to the kingdom. And you can't put a monetary value on that. You are rich. You are wealthy because you are on the road to eternal salvation. So they were rich in faith. We also want to notice, if you'll turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 6, they were rich in good works. We also already said, Jesus said, I know your works. And he had no condemnation for them. So they were rich in good works. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. The Bible says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Okay? Don't trust in your bank account. Don't trust in the car you drive or the house you live in the fancy clothes that you wear. Don't trust in those things. Trust in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. He gave you those possessions anyway. Okay, but they don't really mean that much. Notice verse 18, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. So the brethren at Smyrna said, yeah, you're poor worldly, but you're rich in faith. You are rich in the good works that you've done. And Jesus has commended them. He is pleased with all the works that they have done. Now, if we turn over to Matthew chapter 6, we want to notice they had true riches, not the worldly riches. And think about it, you know, no matter how much money I accumulate and how many fancy cars I get or fine houses or whatever, how much of that is going to go with me when I head to the cemetery? Zero, right? Oh, well, maybe they'll take all the money out of the bank, stuff it in my coffin. Yeah, for what? What good's it going to do me on the other side? God doesn't need money. 
I can't buy my way into heaven, right? So we're, none of us is going to take any of this stuff with us. So it's, it's all temporary, right? But the brethren here, they had true riches, permanent riches. Matthew 6, verses 19 and 20. Lay it not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. That is the true wealth. And it's clear that the brethren at Smyrna, they had the true wealth. They were laying up treasures in heaven. They didn't have a lot of treasure here, but who cares? They were laying up treasure in heaven. That was the, the thing that's going to benefit them eternally. Whereas all those other people in Smyrna, yeah, they may be living it up right now, but that's not going to do them any good on the day of judgment. And so Jesus is telling them, you guys are truly rich. Now, then after this, he goes on to talk about their enemies. That they have enemies. Again, he said, I know your tribulations. They're going to be persecuted. Uh, they are going to suffer quite a bit. Now, they're going to suffer in a couple of ways here. So notice what Jesus said. He says, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogues of Satan. So you see that in verse 9. So he said, I know the tribulations that you're facing, right? So think about the two types of persecutions these brethren are facing. Number one, they're living under Roman rule. They're controlled by the Roman government. And the Romans, of course, were openly hostile to Christians. No doubt about that with all the idol worship that the Romans were engaged in and the emperor worship. And that's the key thing here. As we said, this was a big deal in the city of Smyrna. Well, what the emperors had done is they had made this a law. In Rome, you were required to worship the emperors as a god. And if you did not, you were going to be imprisoned and you were probably going to be executed at some point okay and jesus said here again back in revelation 2 and verse 10 fear none of those things which i shall suffer but the devil shall cast some of you into prison he tells them some of you you're going to be arrested and so the devil here is really kind of referring to the roman government you're you're going to be arrested if you do what's right if you refuse to worship the emperor you're going to be arrested you can take that to the bank it's not a maybe it, it's going to happen and typically with the romans uh, going to prison also meant a death sentence. There were some people that they got out eventually, but a lot of the people that went to prison were eventually executed. So prison and death kind of went hand in hand here. And so these brethren here, that's how they're being persecuted. And Jesus tells them, it, it's going to happen to some, at least some of you, this thing's going to happen. Now, there was also, this is what Jesus references here in verse 9, there was also a large Jewish presence there in Smyrna, and these Jews, of course, they were openly hostile to the Christians at Smyrna. Couldn't stand them. They were enemies of them, and they strongly opposed everything that they stood for and everything they were doing. And so when Jesus says, he's talking about, I know they blaspheme, they claim to be Jews. What he's saying there is, they're still claiming to be the true people of God. And yet what they were doing is they were now persecuting the true people of God. Because again, Jesus nailed the old law to the cross. We're not under that anymore. So they're still trying to cling to that. And they're persecuting the people that now are following what Jesus told them to do. And so this is what he's talking about here. And notice he says, when he's talking about them, he says, they are the synagogue of Satan. Really harsh words from Jesus. Well, what does he mean by that? They're the synagogue of Satan. The synagogue, of course, was the Jewish house of worship. What Jesus is referencing here, he's saying, because they are so cruel and so wicked in their treatment of the Christians, in their fight against Christ, Jesus is saying, they're in reality, they're serving Satan. Now, they never admit that, and they probably in their mind, they don't think that's what they're doing. But Jesus himself said, they are not serving me, they're serving the cause of Satan. That's why it's a synagogue of Satan. They are under Satan's influence. They are doing his will, which is to persecute the followers 
of Christ. But yet they claim they're followers of God, but Jesus is saying they're not really, so they're blaspheming because they're, they're doing these things. Now, if you will, turn over to Luke chapter 6. And we want to notice that like the brethren at Smyrna, we too are going to have enemies like we talked about this morning. If we're faithfully serving God, we're going to have enemies. We're going to have people that hate us and persecute us because they don't like the truth and they don't want to hear it and they don't want to see us doing that. And, and we're seeing a lot of that today in our society where there is definitely a movement to, as we said, outlaw the Bible. Declare it's hate speech. We don't even want to hear. You shouldn't be allowed to preach this stuff. So we're going to face that persecution too. We've been lucky so far that here in the United States, we've never really faced too much of it, but it's coming if, if some people get their way. Well, look at Luke 26, 6, 26. It says, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. And normally we go, wait a minute, that's a good thing, right? Jesus says, no, no, that's bad. When all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. So it might be good for some men to speak well of you. In other words, your fellow Christians. Okay, but notice he says for all men. Like, if everybody says you're a great person, then you're not living righteous. Because that's going to make enemies. As you said, those people aren't going to speak highly of you. Now, I've been to uh, funerals where, and I know they mean well. You know, they're, they're just trying to talk about the deceased was, was a fine person. But I've heard some of those guys say at a funeral, oh, brother so-and-so, he didn't have an enemy in the world. You ever heard that? I've heard that. I go, well, if, he, if that's true and he didn't have an enemy in the world, then I'll show you a man who was not serving the cause of Christ. Because if you do, you're going to have some enemies. You're going to have some people that love you too, but you're going to have some people that despise you. So that's not my goal in life to die and I not have an enemy in the world. That means I need to do something wrong. Because I've got to offend some people if I'm going to do what's right. So that's what Jesus is meaning here when he says, hey, if everybody speaks well of you, that's, that's not necessarily a good thing. Some people are going to be riled up by what you're doing if you're doing what's right. And apparently the brothers and sisters at Smyrna, that's what, that's what they were doing. And so they were being persecuted. Now notice, coming back to Revelation 2, Let's look at verse 10 again. Now Jesus, though he offers them some encouragement, in verse 10, says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Yes, you're going to suffer. You're going to be persecuted. The devil's going to cast some of you into prison. You may be tried. You're going to have tribulation. But he says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Right? So Christ tells them, Don't be afraid. Yes, the persecution is going to come. You just need to endure it. Remember, it's temporary. Okay? But don't be afraid for it. Think about it this way. If you'll turn over to Luke chapter 12, think about it this way. Men can only do so much to you. They can't go beyond a certain point. There's only so much they can do to you. So we see this here in Luke chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. And this is why he's telling us, don't fear men. Even though, yeah, they might imprison you, they may torture you, they may kill you. But don't fear that. Okay? Look here. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. That's all. They can only kill you one time. And as bad as we would dread that, well, it won't last that long and it'll be over with. And, and that, that's all they can do to you. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. That's a permanent persecution, which we don't want. So he said, don't fear the temporary persecution you're going to get here. It's not going to last that long. And you've got an eternal reward waiting for you. You don't want to mess that up. So that temporary persecution, you go through, it'll be all right. You'll get through it. Just stay faithful. Okay? Look at Matthew 28 and verse 20. Because we want to remember that Jesus said, if we'll stay faithful to him, if we stick with him, he'll stick with us. No matter what. He'll be with us. Matthew 28 and verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, 
And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. You stick with me, Christ said, and I'll stick with you. You're, that doesn't mean you're never going to suffer. We've just seen, of course, you're going to suffer. But what he means by I'm going to stick with you, you're going to get that reward just like I promised you. Okay, All this stuff will pass away, and you're going to have eternal bliss because I told you you would. Just stick with me. Endure the suffering. And so that's what Jesus is telling the brethren at Smyrna. Yeah, I know your tribulations. I know what you're going through. I know the Romans are giving you a hard time. I know these so-called Jews are giving you a hard time. It's okay. All this too shall pass. You've been faithful. I want you to stay faithful, and you're going to get that eternal reward. Okay, so we see, speaking of that, we see the promise. And remember we said last week that each one of these letters, all seven of them, they all end with the promise. And we know that God keeps his promises. Okay? So we see this in, in verses 10 and 11. So at the end of verse 10 there, he said, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. And in verse 11, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Okay? So first of all, we see here that Christ promises us a crown of life, that means an eternal life in heaven, but notice if be thou faithful unto death, so if we are faithful unto death we get the crown of life, we talked about that in our sermon a couple weeks ago, salvation is conditional God's love is not conditional, it's unconditional, but our salvation is conditional, it says if you remain faithful to me, I promise you, you'll have eternal life Okay? And we know, again, he's going to keep his promises. So for them and us, if necessary, so far that hasn't been true, but we said this morning, for some Christians around the world it is, uh, for them that meant death was a real possibility. He says, be faithful unto death. You know what? The Romans are going to kill some of them. They are. They're going to do it. Because if you're doing what's right, that means you're going to tell them, no, I'm not going to worship your emperor. He's not a god. What, what did you say? I mean, you couldn't say that. You could not say your emperor is not a god. They'll kill you for that. So it says, you know, if you're going to say, no, I only worship the real god. I'm not going to worship an emperor. They're going to kill you. And so he said, but be faithful unto death. If that's what it takes, you do that, and you're going to get that crown of life. Okay? Now, notice, again, going back into verse 11, he says that he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. You're not going to experience the second death as long as you stay faithful. Well, what is that? What's the second death? What is he referring to? Well, he's talking about spiritual death, the death of the soul. And by that, we don't mean ceasing to exist. The soul will never cease to exist. For the lost, they'd be far better off if it did, but it won't. What he's talking about, the second death, he's talking about an eternal separation from God, an eternal condemnation in hell. That's the second death. Now, if we'll turn over back to Revelation, look at uh, chapter 21, verse 8. We see this confirmed here. We just saw it in Luke 12. Well, let's read it here in Revelation 21 and verse 8. It says, But the fearful, the unbelieving, and the abominable, the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. There it is. Okay? It's an eternal separation from God, eternal torment in hell. So if the brethren at Smyrna or you and I, if we think bad times on earth are bad, we ain't seen nothing yet. Hell's a place I don't ever want to see. And if we go there, we're never getting out. Right? So that's eternal tribulation. So Jesus said, put up with the temporary stuff, and then you're going to have eternal peace and bliss. And again, no sorrow, no tears, no suffering, no death, no pain, no disease, nothing ever again. So the temporary suffering is all going to be worth it. It's all going to be worth it. We just, we've got to remain faithful. So the Christians here at the church at Smyrna, they set a wonderful example for us. Even though they were extremely poor, 
and they were heavily persecuted, they did not waver in their service to Christ. They were steadfast in what they did. Now think about us today. Let, let's look at the, the poverty angle for a second. We live in the wealthiest nation on earth. Not just today, but in the history of mankind. There's really never been a country wealthier than the United States. So you and I are blessed. There's a lot of horrible places in this world that we can live, but we're blessed to live here. And so we need to think about that compared to their poverty, compared to the poverty of so many people around the world. You may know this, or it may come as a surprise to you, but a lot of the, the poverty-stricken people around the world, when they look at poor people in America, they consider our poor people to be rich. Kind of incredible to think about. Because when you think about it, a lot of our poor people, and we do have them, right? They're, they don't have a lot of material wealth, but most all of them have some kind of roof over their head. Most all of them probably have a cell phone. Most all of them probably have some kind of vehicle, not every single one, but a lot of them do. You have a lot of people in the world, they don't have any of those things. They don't even know where their next meal is going to come from. So we've got people that, yeah, maybe I can't go out and buy a steak dinner, but I've at least got enough to go to McDonald's or I've got some money that I can get a meal from. There's people around the world that are starving to death because they, they have nothing. And so they look at us and say, well, boy, I'd like to be as poor as a poor American. So we're, all of us are blessed. Uh, back when the Soviet Union collapsed, back in the 90s, my cousin, he went over there and did some missionary work. He was a member of the church, and they went over there. And he was showing them, some of the kids over there in Russia, he was showing them some pictures of his house here in Cleveland, which is just a split level, you know, three bedroom, very squarely middle class. You would look at, we, you and me would look at it and go, yeah, there's nothing fancy about that. It's just, it's an average, you know. They thought it was a mansion. Really, they really did. That, that's your, have you live in that? And he's, well, yeah, I mean, you know, to us, that's not a big deal. And the other thing was, they, they were just, you know, dumbfounded that, he had his own bedroom, right? So it's a three-bedroom house. So his mom and dad had a bedroom. He had a bedroom. His brother had a bedroom. Those kids couldn't believe that. Uh, well, I've got seven brothers. We all live in the same room. There's eight of us in the room or ten of us in the room. He said, I found that everywhere I went. They could not believe I had that whole room to myself. And it's not by our standards. It's not a very big bedroom. But to them, they would have just about killed to have had something like that. And so he told me, he said, that really opened my eyes to, you know, we take so many things for granted. They have nothing in a lot of these places. So we have not experienced that kind of poverty. Even the poor among us, we've not been poor like a lot of people around the world have. And we, and we should count that as a blessing. And think about the persecution as well. If we're living right, we may suffer some kinds of persecution, but not like what they were suffering. Nobody's putting us in prison. Nobody's executing us because we're not engaged in idolatry or emperor worship or whatever. It hasn't got to that point, at least not yet. It has for a lot of people. So we need to remember that, how they were persecuted. Yet so many Christians here, they allow any little excuse to divert them from their service to God. Any little thing that can sidetrack them or you know, if there's any kind of suffering involved whatsoever, well, they, they don't really want to do it. And yet, those same people still think they're going to go to heaven when they're not willing to suffer anything for God. So I, I put this picture up there. I don't know how well y'all can see this, but this was during the Civil Rights Movement. And back then, of course, we had restaurants where, you know, whites only, blacks only, you couldn't eat there. And so you've got three people sitting in the counter here. You've got a, a black girl and two white people who have joined her. And as you, maybe you can see this, you can tell, there's a whole mob of people behind them. They are cussing at them, yelling at them. They are covered in milkshakes and, and ketchup. And they've poured stuff all over them. You can see one guy there, he's, he's pouring his drink uh, on her head. Uh, those people, they were committed 
to civil rights. They were committed to the idea that white people and black people ought to be able to eat in the same restaurant. Right? They were willing to suffer this kind of, and, and some of them were beat up. I mean, it got even worse for some of these people. But they were committed to civil rights. And, and that's an admirable thing. But how much more so should you and I be committed to God? Are, are we willing to suffer anything like that for our faith? Are we willing to stand up for Christ if it means we're going to be attacked? That's something we need to ask ourselves. And so Christ committed Smyrna, because in spite of their poverty, in spite of their persecution, he said, you've been steadfast. He offered no rebuke to them whatsoever. Would Christ say the same thing about us? We need to ask ourselves that question. If the persecution came, would we hold up against it? Could he say the same thing about us? We need to do everything we can to remain faithful to God, no matter what trials and tribulations come our way. And if we do that, that means we will not be rebuked on the day of judgment. Because if we are rebuked on the day of judgment, it'll be too late to do anything about it. So let's do it now. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, you need to become one. God has commanded all of us to obey all of his commandments. And that means we have to be baptized into Christ. It's the only way that you can wash away your sins is to be baptized. There is no magical power in the water. It's regular tap water. The power is in the obedience that you are showing. God told me to be baptized, to be added to his church, so I'm going to do that. So if you haven't become a Christian, we can help you with that tonight. If you are a Christian, but you've fallen away, you've not been steadfast like the brethren were, at Smyrna, and you need to fix that, you need to change it before it's everlastingly too late. We can help you with it. We can pray with you and for you, and God's promise that he'll forgive you if you'll turn from those sins. So if you have a need, please come forward as together we stand and we sing. I wandered far away from God.
ask everybody to please remember services on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. Next Sunday morning, Bible study at 9.30. Regular services at 10.30 on Sunday night at 6 o'clock. Remember that. Also, is there anyone present that has not had an opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper? Thank <laughs> you. 